were two key plays early in that one as well. Hey, well we have we Oh, my God, look at that. The freeway has just completely collapsed. A major earthquake, an earthquake which was felt from Oakland to Sacramento as far south as Los Angeles. The natural gas lines have ruptured. You can see this building is collapsed. They don't know if people are still in there or if they aren't. An entire section of the Bay Bridge has been lost. The downtown section of Santa Cruz is basically gone. The Loma Prieta quake was a magnitude 6.9. It left 3,800 people injured, 63 dead, 16,000 homes uninhabitable. As bad as it was, experts say Loma Prieta was just a warm-up. The first thing to, for people to realize is that Loma Prieta was not the big one. So what will it be like when the real big one hits? Where is the biggest danger? And are we ready? It is going to be the challenge of all of our lives when we have this earthquake happen here. I'm Drew Tuma with ABC7, standing in the middle of the incredible beauty that makes the San Francisco Bay Area so special. What you might not realize is the same geologic forces that create our gorgeous bays, hills, and valleys also make our region what some scientists call a tectonic time bomb. The last time the full power of the San Andreas Fault exploded in the Bay Area was the great San Francisco quake of 1906, now believed to have been a magnitude 7.9 with devastating results. Geologists now believe the 1906 earthquake released 16 times more energy than the Loma Prieta quake in 1989. I've never seen anything like it. It was like the exorcist or something. She was flying, literally being flown from one side of the room, back and forth, being pounded into the wall. And it will happen again. Regardless of where you live in the Bay Area, you're not far from a fault. And there are enough faults that if any one of them has a major earthquake, it's going to affect the entire Bay Area. I lost everything except for me. Scientists say the network of faults running under the Bay Area is locked and loaded, with a major quake expected at any time. This map shows the likelihood of an earthquake of 6.7 or higher on each of the Bay Area faults by the year 2043. The probabilities range from 6 to 33%, but put them all together, and the chance of a major quake somewhere in the Bay Area jumps to 72%. And that's a very, very high number. David Schwartz has spent most of his career trying to refine those calculations and get the public to take earthquake danger seriously. I think we're going to be very, very surprised at the amount of damage that occurs. I mean, for all of the retrofitting that's been done, for all of the new engineering that's been done, uh, I think we could look at small earthquakes like Napa in 2014, that was a magnitude 6, and look at the extent of damage. Well, you go to a 7, or you go to a 7.9, the damage is spread over a much, much wider area. And if you have a minute and a half or two minutes of shaking, you know, it's really unclear what that's going to do to a lot of structures that are out there. To get an idea of how much the ground moved in 1906 and will move again in the future, I'm here in West Marin County, right on the San Andreas Fault. The fault line runs right along here. Check out these two fences on either side of me. Before the 1906 earthquake, this fence actually matched up with that fence in a straight line. When the earthquake struck, there was violent shaking. When it was all over, the ground and the fence on the west side of the fault had moved north an incredible 16 feet. The reason California is at such a high risk for earthquakes is that we are right on the edge of two huge plates in the Earth's crust. 
the Pacific Plate on the west and the North American Plate on the east. The San Andreas Fault runs between the two plates, right through California. The Pacific Plate on the left is constantly moving north. The movement is usually so slow, we don't feel it. But sometimes the pressure builds and the ground shoots forward faster, causing an earthquake. Zooming in, you can see how the San Andreas Fault lines up here, with most of the Bay Area to the east. Fast forward through millions of years of ground movement, and Los Angeles is actually expected to be right alongside San Francisco. But long before that happens, we have many other earthquake faults to worry about too. Right now, I'm flying over the Hayward Fault, which many experts say is the most dangerous fault in America. We're using SkyMap 7 to show you why it's such a threat. That red line is the Hayward Fault, and you can see it runs through some of the most heavily populated areas in the Bay Area, with about 300 buildings directly on the fault itself. So when it moves, and if it moves two feet or three feet or six feet, those structures are gonna be stressed and many of them are gonna fail. The Hayward Fault runs along the East Bay Hills from San Jose north to San Pablo. Some of the buildings along the fault are iconic structures. The Mormon Temple in Oakland, the Claremont Hotel, the UC Berkeley Football Stadium. Many have had major seismic improvements in recent years, but most of the buildings are homes, and there's no telling how many of them will perform when a big earthquake hits the fault. It also, of course, crosses large numbers of lifelines, that is roads and uh, utility lines and water mains that go from the eastern part of California into the Bay Area. Take a look at the Hayward Fault's path along Lake Temescal in Oakland. The fault crosses highways 24 and 13, runs along a PG&E substation, crosses a water line, and a BART tunnel. Serious damage to any of these will likely affect the whole Bay Area region. The last time a really big earthquake hit the Hayward Fault was in 1868. Back then, there were about 25,000 people in the area. Now, there are about 2 million. Most probably have no idea what's happening right below them. Hayward Fault is pretty unique in that it creeps. So it actually is moving very, very slowly all the time. Over the past million years, that nonstop movement actually created the East Bay Hills, and it has not stopped. We are in Fremont's original city hall. This building is right on top of the Hayward Fault. This crack first appeared in 1972 and was never repaired. So now it's an ongoing record of how the fault keeps moving. One side has moved forward, one side has moved backwards. You can also see there has been some separation between the two sides. And one side of the floor is actually higher than the other side of the floor. So we have all three of those things happening at the same time. This muddy pond nearby is the epicenter for research on the Hayward Fault. What we've been able to show here is that during the past 1,700 years, there have been 12 large earthquakes. We opened up trenches. They went down 8, 9, 10, 12 feet. We cleaned the walls. We could see the different layers in the trench that had been deposited in the pond. And you can see the fault. This is a fault. A fault trace. The research at the pond is over. And now, a BART extension to San Jose crosses directly over the fault. The uh, fault is spread out beneath our feet. David also showed us around downtown Hayward, where the fault's signature is especially obvious. From buildings slowly sliding apart to others, like the old city hall, completely abandoned. You can cover the fault up, but in the end, the fault always wins. Braces and bolts tell the story of constant effort to prepare for the next big earthquake, but it's a never-ending battle. This floor was painted only two years ago, but it sits atop the Hayward Fault, and you can already see it's doing its damage. And it's not just the floor that's cracking. The Hayward Fault is also causing the side of the building to begin to crack as well. These cracks may look minor now, but experts say it's critical the public understand the danger that is coming. 
That's why the U.S. Geological Survey and its partners spent years on a project they call Haywire, a science-based scenario showing what could happen if a magnitude 7 earthquake hits the Hayward Fault. The earthquake begins. With an epicenter at Oakland, the rupture races 52 miles along the fault towards Fremont and Richmond at speeds of 7,000 miles per hour. In Berkeley and Hayward, the ground shifts three to five feet, ripping through buried pipes and wires. The USGS shake map shows areas of violent and extreme shaking, lasting up to 30 seconds or longer, causing very heavy damage. Away from the epicenter, a warning arrives up to 25 seconds before strong shaking begins. Impacts and destruction are magnified by a cascade of hazards. The predictions in the haywired scenario are grim. 800 dead, 18,000 injured. Of course, this is just one possible way a major earthquake may play out, but it is a serious planning tool. So how we prepare for something that we haven't experienced is that we pretend. Mary Ellen Carroll is head of the San Francisco Office of Emergency Management. We're in the command center where her team handles real events and practices for the next big quake. We are looking at thousands of buildings lost, potentially hundreds of thousands of people that may be trapped in the city, depending on the time of day. There will be many injuries and deaths. There's just no way around that. It's, it's not a good scenario. And don't think you are safe just because you don't live or work right on a fault. So the shaking intensity isn't right at the fault or just at the fault. It's over a pretty wide swath as you go away from the fault. You're going to feel strong shaking across the entire region. The epicenter of the Loma Prieta earthquake was in the Santa Cruz Mountains. But some of the worst damage was actually 50 miles away. And the effects of a bigger quake could travel even farther. Expect major power outages. Most communication, including mobile phones and the internet, will be down. Thousands of people may have no water for weeks, maybe months. In addition to shake damage, major fires could cause even more destruction. The question is, what will that be like for those of us who survive? And so the steps that we take to prepare individually is so critical. As bad as a major quake will be, every expert we talked to agreed. We are safer now than we were 30 years ago. The Bay Area region has spent an estimated $80 billion on a wide range of seismic improvements since Loma Prieta. Mary Camarillo is a disaster recovery expert. We have required hospitals to be significantly upgraded all across the state. Locally, we have improvements to Hetch Hetchy, the water supply system, and to BART. We also have had retrofit ordinances for brick buildings and soft story apartments. We've spent over $9 billion on the large bridges in the Bay Area. We've had tens of thousands of professionals come here over the last 20 years and help us with this. It's the biggest thing that we've ever done as a state is prepare this region for the next earthquake. Even so, a major earthquake will do serious damage to many roads and Bay Area airports. So Caltrans has built what it calls lifeline routes, specific highways engineered to withstand the region's strongest expected earthquake. These are going to be the roadways that emergency services use to begin the, the relief for the area once this earthquake hits. Go prepare yourselves. Prepare yourselves. Shut off the gas. Shut off electricity. Store water in your bathtub. Don't expect services for 72 hours. One of the enduring lessons from Loma Prieta is that in a large-scale disaster, many of us will be on our own for hours, maybe days. Our preparation for disaster will make the difference, and so will regular people who step up when first responders are overwhelmed. That's what happened in San Francisco's Marina District. People we never knew and they never knew us, but they carried us in their arms down the, the stairs. And at the collapse of the double-decker Cypress Freeway in Oakland. Within a few minutes, a police officer came by and we asked, were they going to send help? And she said, there is no help to send now. 
you guys are on your own. A uh, company right across the street had some, uh, some extension ladders. We went over there, clammed the fence, got the ladders, threw them back over the fence, and that's how we uh, got up on top of the freeway because the fire department was not here. Uh, no one was here but us. Ultimately, those experiences led to the formation of a more organized citizen response for future disasters. Neighborhood volunteers and teams just everyday people, your neighbors, that are trained by the fire department around first aid, around basic, what we would call search and rescue. Looking back on the terrifying hours after the Loma Prieta quake, it's the courage and the heart shown by both first responders and ordinary citizens that stand out. First, fighting disaster. Then, trying to help victims move forward. A tidal wave of volunteers staffing shelters, residents taking people into their own homes. This kind lady, a perfect stranger, took us in, and she's a wonderful, wonderful person. She's a good Christian. Restaurants donating meals, union workers providing free labor, the crane operator with a delicate touch, trying to save people's belongings in the rubble. I'm so emotional over a piece of stained glass. All proving over and over when it comes to fundamental values in a crisis, we in the Bay Area are made of the right stuff. There's a lot that was inspiring about what happened after the Loma Prieta earthquake. And we learned some critical lessons, especially about the way we build things in the Bay Area. ABC 7 News reporter Leslie Brinkley was on the Bay Bridge when the earthquake struck. It's been a frightening scene here. As you can see just below me is where this crack in the Bay Bridge occurred, a 50-foot section. You see down there below the two cars, two cars that were on the upper deck when the bridge collapsed. We were just floored by what we were seeing. Things were so much worse than we expected them to be. We were shocked at the outcome of some of the structures then, and we learned that um, we needed to design bridges differently. It was a normal news day. We left the station, got onto the bridge. We're headed for a Caltrans meeting on the Oakland side. We're talking. All of a sudden, it felt like our truck was on a trampoline uh, or tires had blown. It was just moving in every direction, up and down, side to side. And that was right at 5.04 PM. Looking out our windows all around us were dirt, crumbles of little rocks falling down, raining down onto our truck. We managed to drive off the bridge and pull off to the side of the road. We got out of the vehicle, I put my foot on the ground, and an aftershock hit. It was an amazing sensation. It was one thing to experience the quake inside the truck and the motion of that. It was yet another to put your feet on the earth and feel it move. But it was the moment we pulled off and started talking to some other drivers that had pulled off when one driver told me that he saw in his rear view mirror what looked like a big concrete garage door slamming down behind him. And that point, we realized the Bay Bridge broke. We understand from the Caltrans folks that the top portion, that 50-foot portion you saw before, did collapse onto the bottom of the Bay Bridge. We understand that two cars that were driving on the top also fell with that piece. The thought of just missing that has never left me. 30 seconds earlier, I might have been where that piece of the bridge collapsed. There was this explosion. It sounded like dynamite. And right in front of us, I saw the upper deck split. It was kind of like a big giant had grabbed the end of the bridge and just shook it. And, you know, there was just nothing that could stop it. You were like a plate on the table that was going to end up on the floor. The Caltrans crew let us get in the back of their pickup truck as they, for the first time, were driving on to that empty stretch of the Bay Bridge to go check out the damage. I was stunned at the magnitude of the damage. A car dangling off the side like you might see in a movie. I keep being haunted by his face, his eyes, the terror he must have felt launching over that chasm and landing and clinging to the side of that break in the bridge, the car dangling off the edge. And these folks are just getting rescued right now. It's been about an hour-long effort. 
I was witnessing uh, the rescue of Lasita Halanahu, who was in the passenger seat of that car, and the, the death of his sister-in-law, who was driving the car, Anamafi Kalausa. I was lucky to get to the, to be a survivor. It's been a frightening scene here. As you can see just below me is where this crack in the Bay Bridge occurred, a 50-foot section. You see down there below the two cars, two cars that were on the upper deck when the bridge collapsed. They fell below. We understand that the people in both of those cars did get out safely. How are you able to walk? Fear. I wanted off the bridge. You looked down and you knew the Bay Area world had changed forever with what happened there. The Bay Bridge broke because that quake shifted and pulled and twisted at it so it moved two inches north and five inches east. Imagine the bridge moving that much. The Bay Area was just a fractured place when it was out. Memories of the earthquake are not forgotten as quickly as bridges are repaired. In 30 days, Caltrans created a new bridge. Safer, they say, stronger, but not earthquake-proof. So it, it began the healing process when finally a month later, we all sort of collectively celebrated that Bay Bridge is back in, in operation. We actually couldn't keep the eastern span of the old bridge. Where it collapsed, the old Bay Bridge had about four inches of movement that it could accommodate. Once the, once the seismic forces took it beyond that and the bolts were sheared, then the bridge collapsed. When we took a look at it, we did repair it in about a month and put it back into service and, um, and made it stronger, but we knew we couldn't keep it because that bridge was built on timber piles down into the Bay Mud. And so the foundations were, were not going to last. I was always floored by the fact that it took us over 20 years to build a new Bay Bridge. We had this old Bay Bridge that obviously collapsed in a quake, and here we go living with it for 24 years before we replace it. That's shocking. One of the unique things about designing the, the new Bay Bridge is that it has a major fault on one end of the bridge and a completely different major fault on the other end of the Bay Bridge. So on one end, you have Hayward. On the other end, you have San Andreas. The people of the region chose that we wanted to build uh, the world's largest self-anchored suspension bridge. Uh, we needed to come up with some innovative ways to be able to protect that bridge too. And that's where we came up with the idea of fuses like a fuse in your car pops so that you don't break your radio system. Well, we put fuses in that bridge so they would take the damage, allow the bridge to not only stand, but be built to something we call lifeline criteria. And what that means is that after a very large scale earthquake, we're able to put the bridge back into service so that it can accommodate the emergency services. We're standing in between the westbound and eastbound decks of the traffic. Right above, above us, um, you can slightly hear the eastbound and westbound traffic going on. And when another big earthquake happens, we're going to dance with Mother Nature. We're going to sway. We're going to be moved. We're going to be fluid, not going to be stiff and rigid. We saw what happened. We learned the lessons. And this is, this is a result of learning that lesson. This is a section that would take any of the energy of the damage. So we can, this can be broken, we can replace this. But this allows these sections to move lateral and even side to side. In an event of a major earthquake, this is the section that, these are gonna be gone. This above us is gonna be gone. And we have to get this bridge back in service. It's a lifeline bridge, okay, for emergency vehicles. And again, these areas here are gonna allow this bridge to take that impact. This is the section that we talked about where the sliding goes in and out. So this is the area that's going to you go know, right there. And there's 20 throughout the Skyway in the uh, San Francisco suspension span. So shearling beams, there's 120 of the shearling beams. And you'll notice them as we go up into the tower. You're going to see them on the exterior and also on the inside. Those act as uh, fuses as well. So those are allowed, they flex. So they allow the tower to sway and move with an earthquake. You know, we have four uh, legs of the tower. Most people think it's just one tower. There's actually four beams, four tower beams that make up the one tower. Caltrans gave me as a souvenir this 
sheared off bolt from the old Bay Bridge. I treasure this as something that reminds me of what happened and what could happen again. This bolt attached that section of the roadbed to the old Bay Bridge. And when it started sliding and shifting and twisting in the quake, this bolt sheared, as did many others. And that's what gave way. That's what caused the bridge to collapse. I have this in a special place at my house. Uh, it's a memory for me of a bad moment and a memory of the hope going forward of building something better next time. I drive on that lower deck of the Bay Bridge. I, I want to get off of here before there's an earthquake. I hope there's not an earthquake right now. That runs through my, my mind. It's one of the top three busiest bridges in the nation, and we put a new bridge in the same footprint as the old bridge without disturbing traffic too much. We designed a bridge that could last 150 years, and then we, we multiplied that times 10 with its performance. That bridge can withstand the biggest earthquake motions that would happen in a 1,500-year period. I see a beautiful bridge. I visually love it, that intense white as you drive up onto it, that big soaring tower. I tell myself I feel safer on it because I know engineered into it are safety things that did not exist in that old eastern cantilevered section of the Bay Bridge that I was on. I feel more secure, but I know how insecure we all really are when it comes to if, when, and how big that next quake is. You can find out much more about the earthquake effect at abc7news.com, including a revealing look at thousands of homes and apartments at risk of collapse during a quake. And an expert tells us the one place he'd want to be when the big one hits. It might surprise you. Plus, a Sky 7 flyover of the Hayward Fault, an interactive map that shows the fault's exact location, along with all the homes and landmarks sitting right on top of it. I'm Drew Tuma, reminding you, make a plan, be prepared.